Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Buckeye Weekly Podcast. I am Tony Gerdeman here, as always, with Tom. Or, Tom, how's it going? Tony, I'm fine. But much more importantly, how are you doing today? We never hear about you. I want to hear all about how you're doing. Doing well. Doing well. Can't complain. That's not what this show is about. People are generally accustomed to hearing you complain. I am, however, the the bigger person when it comes to that. I just I try not to bring my problems onto the viewers and to the listeners. I could regale you with issues that I currently have, but I won't. I will save that for our Patreon show. And now people are like, "Are they? Do they? No, 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 no." We stopped doing that when we went to a subscription site. So no, yeah. No. We stop doing that when people stop paying us to hear us complain about our lives. <laughs> I mean, that was four hours extra a show a, a week, and people didn't want. You know what? You really grinds my gears, starring Tony Gerderman. <laughs> yes, that's uh, one of one of our best products, but alas, thing in the thing of the past. And and we are not here to talk about the past. That is not what this show is about. In fact, Tom, um, today's show is talking about the future. And this is where you go. The future, Conan. It's a it's a Conan and Andy thing, but yes, the future. Yeah, go ahead, Tom. Were you aware? In the year two thousand, yes. That's that's the that's the uh, mm-hmm. that that's the bit that makes me feel very old because it was when the year two thousand was in the near future and now. Anyway. You're you're not here to be here to you're not here to listen to me complain about the uh, immutable march of time. So uh, yes, go ahead. Let's talk college football instead. Yeah. So Sports Illustrated's Ross Dellinger is really good national reporter, news guy, uh, reporting about uh, possible likely changes coming to the college football calendar. Uh, Tom, he mentions like this 365 day calendar that you know college football has. But as you and I cover this thing, like we already have a 365 day calendar when it comes to college football it's like we've always it's broken up into seasons you've got college football season that starts in september and goes until the the january whatnot then it's signing day season which runs to february then there's uh about a two-week break before spring starts and then you got spring football season and then you've got like may to july which is a break and uh, the calm time, but you still have to do stuff. You still have to uh, produce content. And then you, you get to July, and that's about the start of camp, and then, boom, you're, you're in the football season. But this uh, calendar that he's talking about is uh, still up for uh, approval, and it's been put together by all conferences. And so I'll just run down the list, and then we can go back to the top and discuss these things. So the first one would be uh, week zero would essentially become week one. The season would move up a day or move up a week, and uh, everybody would be able to take part. Bowl games would start uh, be able to start the second Saturday of December. Uh, coaches can meet with junior high school juniors off campus. Currently, it can only be on campus. There would be uh, the current 45-day transfer window that begins uh, December 5th. And then the the spring one uh, that begins a 15 day window that begins March, May 1st, that is still in play. And then they would add a 48 hour dead period a week prior to that December 5th portal opening, and that may be uh, extended from two days to a week, which I think is a, a very good idea for reasons we can get to. But then also pushing the early signing day from. Was it the second Wednesday or mid Wednesday in December to the first, the third Monday in December, uh, effectively pushing it five days back and and creating some room there. And then uh, this is one uh, prohibiting coaches from visiting players in the transfer portal on their existing campus. I think that's a a pretty decent rule. And then uh, a dead period during the Memorial Day weekend, which. I mean the terminology there, but <laughs> I just—that's why you don't say happy. That's why you have, don't say happy recruiting season during Memorial Day weekend. Not many people know that. Yeah, that that one. Uh, but you know that's just the terminology there. But so that's those are the the proposed rules, and some of those already existing will just get folded in. Um, as I was looking at this, we, when the, you see, well, week one just becomes week zero becomes week one. I'm thinking, cool. I like the seasons where there are two bye weeks. 
And we, I think we've got one maybe next year, the year after, where they're scheduled to be two bye weeks. But instead, uh, it looks like this is probably being done, would be done to get that expanded playoff, um, more room to get that in. Because as I was trying to jot this down, like what the playoffs would look like this year, there's the NFL just ruins everything when it comes to trying to put this playoff together because you can't do anything on a Saturday or a Sunday and probably sometimes you can't do anything on a Monday. So everything has to be like almost between Tuesday and Thursday because you don't necessarily want to put it on a Friday either. And it, it becomes an issue. And one of the other issues that they're trying to figure out is, you know, the playoffs start in 2026. They're trying to figure out if they can move everything to 2024 and uh, Tom, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but cities are already booked for all sorts of things in 2024 and 2025 right now. So this is creating some other issues. But just uh, would you be in favor, Tom, of the difficult task of starting the college football season one week earlier? I am strongly in favor of that. And it would be truly wonderful if that was for two off weeks for all the teams in the middle of the season. It's you know, I mean, it's great for us as people who cover the sport, but if you're going to be asking college football players to play additional playoff games, potentially as many as two additional playoff games, it seems only right that you give them a little more time to heal up and rest up in the middle of the season. That seems like pretty much quite literally the least you can do. Now, is that why? Is that the why behind what they're doing? No, it is not. It is probably logistics on the... Uh, logistics on the playoff, and it's also, guess what? You have an extra week of TV broadcast windows to sell, so guess what? That's just more product. Even though Ohio State's not playing any extra games, there will be an you know one extra week at the beginning of the season where they can sell pickup trucks and beer and terrible political ads and all of that kind of stuff. All the networks make more money. It will probably result in a little bit of it. I'm sure that's written into all of the TV contracts that, hey, if we have an extra week of games, you're going to, you know, increase our our payout proportionately for the extra, you know, one thirteenth or one fourteenth of it. So it's like another 7% of uh, the contract. Here you go. I'm sure that's the reason why. From a player health standpoint, I mean, yes, it's an extra week of practice during the middle of the season, so that's something, but it's also, you can limit the amount of contact guys have in practice, you cannot limit the amount of contact the guys have in games, and they, you know, they talk about exposures all the time, and you can, you can not, you you can, you can not have a non-contact week of practice, or, you know, just go shell, you know, maybe you're required to go shells during one of those bye weeks, whatever. You can, you can make this a beneficial thing for the players. It remains to be seen whether they will actually do that, but it is set up in such a way that potentially it could be, which would be a good thing. Yeah, and really, the only reason not to do that is if they would want to just end the playoffs a week sooner, basically. Like, if they don't want to go into mid to late January and just want to stay in mid-January, then that would be the reason for not having those two, uh, that extra bye week. I don't know that what are you really gaining by getting rid of that bye week? You're losing, as you said, a week of content, a week of games, basically. And for what? So that you can get the playoffs done sooner before maybe the NFL playoffs start. And really, as, as we as, as we'll show, the college football playoffs and the college football season has to move around what the NFL does anyway. And then the later this goes on, like once you get to mid-December, the NFL is playing on Saturdays because college football no longer is or was. And so that's going to be an issue as well, which is why, like, if they if they do move everything up a week, now you have the conference championship games on Thanksgiving weekend, which I don't know how people feel about that. That is traditionally, a, you know, the we got used to it being rivalry weekend. And do you really want that to be a – You're a lot of people are already traveling. Does it make it even more difficult for fans to then travel to the the conference championship games if they've already spent money to go see family? And then are they leaving family early? I, I, it just feels like this is a lot of – it creates some unnecessary issues. But if you're just trying to get – 35,000 fans from each side. It's like, I think there's still going to be enough 
fans there to sell these places out or to at least make them look like they're sold out. Yeah, people will get there one way or the other. It will make it more difficult and make it a little more stressful. That's always kind of a stressful weekend anyway for people because there's a lot of travel and it's not, you know, not that there's really a fun time to fly at this point in our history, but it is really not a fun time to fly uh, the week of Thanksgiving. And people, you know, you're talking about people having to come back potentially early or, you know, if you have to, fl- you know, Ohio State fans can just drive to Indianapolis. There are fan bases that ha- would, you know, Flying to Indianapolis would make life a lot easier and make that trip a lot easier for Nebraska, Minnesota, people like that. Well, that is a very expensive and very difficult week to fly. So if you're trying to fly the Friday after Thanksgiving and you have to book that ticket on a week or two notice, guess what? That ticket is going to cost $1 trillion. So that makes it a lot harder for those fan bases to get there. And I know, haha, you know, Nebraska and the Big Ten Championship game. Like, I get it. But, I mean, there are other... There are plenty, you know, Oregon to the Pac-12 championship game in Las Vegas or, uh, you know, Missouri fans going to Atlanta for the uh, big, big, uh, the SEC championship game or Boston College fans going down to Charlotte for the the ACC championship game, whatever it is, Miami fans to the, to, Chicago, to Charlotte. There's, there's lots and lots of fan bases that would potentially have to fly for those weekends. Miami fans traveling. <laughs> now, now I've now I've done it. Uh, but you you have. You know, you're creating a very difficult situation for people. Now, the real question, Tony, is do the people running college football give a crap? And the answer is, mm, uh, I don't. Based on history, I don't know that the uh, fan experience is necessarily going to be right at the top of the list of things that they're actually considering while they're sorting all of this out. Tom, say UCLA and Miami were to play in, like, the Frisco Bowl. How many student tickets do you think would be sold? Would it be over a thousand? Uh, depends on if they open it up to Frisco High School students. If so, uh, maybe fifty-six. Maybe remember when UConn went to the Fiesta Bowl and they lost a ton of money because it's like we sold eight hundred tickets. It would be kind of like that. Yes. Golly, that was you talk about what a time to be alive now. What a time to be alive then, UConn going there so what i wanted to do is just if if the playoffs the expanded playoffs were this year i just wanted to go through the dates of what this would look like so we have an idea of how long this thing is actually going to last and the kind of impact it would have and the rules as they're written now state that the the expanded playoffs would begin uh at least uh you, you get 12 days after the conference championship game and so that means you're looking at a Thursday start for these these on campus first round games most likely, and you might it might be a Thursday Friday thing where you know it's half of them are Thursday, half of them are Friday, and again Friday night is what the worst time to be on television in terms of you know wanting the bang for your buck. But this is life when you can't necessarily put anything on a, a, a Saturday or a Sunday because of the NFL now. The NFL playoffs this year start like um, January 15th, so they're out of the picture, and that's generally when they're going to start. But I'm not sure if that first Saturday when the NFL is playing would match up with uh, Saturday first round game. So they'll probably, you know, the NFL's not moving for anything. They're going to do what they do. So I'm thinking we would expect Thursday and Friday of the fir- for the first round games. So then... That means the quarterfinals, it's not going to be a week later, and it can't be during the weekend, and it can't necessarily be on a Monday because of Monday Night Football, which I guess at least it's Amazon, so you can maybe go against Amazon. But So you're talking about the quarterfinals, which would be, say, Ohio State, if they have a bye, their first game would be around December 27th or 28th, and... Then the semifinals after that would be again you 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 go you can't necessarily go a week out so then you've got to push things even further back and and it's almost two weeks for a break for that you go to January 10th for the semis and then like another ten days later you you go from a Tuesday game to a Thursday game or something like that and so that's like nine eight days later and ends you know like the 19th or 20th of January, which, um, you know, what, 
that seems impossible because we already end on the ninth, and I'm I'm wondering like it doesn't uh, just the twentieth of January. It, Tom, I don't know that the math makes sense to me. Well, I think you have to kind of look at this with I think you look at this with the quarterfinals in mind because the quarterfinals that those are you know. You're talking about December 27th and 28th. I wonder if you kick those back and you make those, you center New Year's Day around those and you make the quarterfinals just there's a a 12, a 3, a 6, and a 9 or whatever. And, and you know, realistically, you're not going to fit four games in there. So do you start at 11? Because the way they televise these games, they go closer to four hours than they do to three. So, you know, does it start 11 and 2.30 and... Six and nine thirty. I mean, that would be a incredible day of college football. But also, you know, one of the games will run long, and then that will push the next game back, and that will push the next game back. That that is how I would love to see New Year's Day turn back into college football, the quarterfinals, and it just completely owns New Year's Day in a way that it used to and has not for a little while. I don't think that's what they're going to do. I could also see them going two quarterfinals on New Year's Eve two quarterfinals on New Year's Day. And, you know, the next the next note you have here is about the bowl games and involving the bowl games and what's the Rose Bowl going to do and all that kind of stuff. The Rose Bowl and the Sugar Bowl have been kind of allowed to maintain their January 1st place. If you do it this way, then the, then the quarterfinals, the Rose Bowl, and the, in, you know, is the mid-afternoon quarterfinal slot, and then the Sugar Bowl is the uh, evening Sugar Bowl, or evening quarterfinal slot, and then you make the Orange Bowl the New Year's Eve ev- evening slot, and the Fiesta Bowl or the Cotton Bowl or whatever you want to have as your uh, as your um, you know mid afternoon New Year's Eve slot. I to me that's the most logical way to do it is to look at the quarterfinals, figure out how you're going to work the bowls in because they're they're insistent on making this you know incorporating the bowls into this process. So that's the way to do it. I think I don't know that that's how they're going to do it, but I think that's the way I would approach it. Start there rather than trying to you know. Oh, talk the Rose Bowl into doing something on December 27th or whatever, like make New Year's New Year's Day, which is your day as a college football sport, make that your, still your day. And, you know, if the if that means the Outback Bowl and the Citrus Bowl and uh, heaven forbid the Gator Bowl have to lose their spots on New Year's Day, like, well, that's fine. So be it. Or or make it a triple header on New Year's Day and New Year's Eve is just the one game. Because they've had a terrible time with TV ratings on New Year's Eve anyway. So maybe it's New Year's Eve and it's the, you know, it's a six o'clock kickoff East Coast time on New Year's Eve. And then you're still getting kind of a primetime audience, but you're not getting into the people going out for New Year's Eve time. I mean, there's there's workarounds here, but I think a lot of it, the way I would approach it would be to start with those quarterfinals and then you work from there each way. Yeah, I like that. That's kind of the cornerstone of it. And you, you build off of that. And really, that wouldn't necessarily change any of the dates of the semis because you still have, I mean, if we're talking about the semis be, being like on a Tuesday, January 10th, you, you've got 10 days to prepare. It just feels like all of these games, you're going to have more than a week to prepare. And given the the like flighty nature of, you know, not necessarily knowing which opponent and where you're going and what cities and, and things like that, then that's probably good to give teams and people and fans more than normal time to prepare. But like, I don't really have any issue with the season going until mid to late January. Like I don't, other than, you know, the, the start things are taking longer, but college basketball season is a long season. You know, that goes from November to March. That's, that's, you know, five, six months, basically, you know, including practice and football expanding for a couple of more weeks, basically. I don't think that's too much to ask, especially when if we can get that extra bye week in there, players are making money, so it's not like they're just being abused or anything like that. Now, you know, they've they've been granted some rights, and, and to give them an extra bye week I think is beneficial. Do you have any issue of saying the season ends January 23rd instead of January 9th. I mean, is that is that really all that terrible? It's not that terrible. I'm not a super big fan of 
putting two weeks between the semifinals and the final, or, you know, 11 days between the semifinals and the final, that seems like a lot. You know, the the NFL thing where there's like the whole week between the conference finals and the Super Bowl, that's like unnecessary to me. I, you know, I, I wonder if they go, you know, if it's a Tuesday, January 10th kind of, uh, you know, kind of uh, um, semifinal or a Thursday, January 12th kind of semifinal, if you don't just go the following Thursday, the following Friday, something like that, you know, I know Friday night is typically not a great time for TV, but it has always struck me that, you know, the national championship game in basketball, it's always on a Monday night. The national championship game in football is always on a Monday night. It's it's always on a work night for people. And, like, if you're going to have people over, like, go have a party, go out, have fun, like, the... Yeah, I don't know if you remember what the city of Columbus was like the morning after the uh, national championship game in 2000, January of 2015, but uh, my commute into work was real, 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 real easy that morning because everyone else was uh, still asleep and or hungover and or, uh, you know, still still out somewhere and hadn't gotten home yet. It th- That is a difficult time to, to ask people to do it. And it's just, they just, that is kind of how they have always done it. But if Friday is open, Friday nights are open, that seems like that would be a great, you know, lead into the NFL playoff weekend is have your college football national championship on a Friday night. And then you can have, you know, that that makes it so then that can be like an event night and Mm -hmm. a holiday. You can plan ahead. It's, you know, I, I, to me, that makes that, that makes a lot more sense, but you know, I'm, uh, Again, this is this is something that the TV networks are going to tell them. Here's when you're going to have this, and then they'll say, "Sir, yes, sir," and that'll be the end of it. But I I agree. Just creating a basically a national holiday around it, where it's the, it's the Friday, it's the championship game of Friday, and if people are going out, they're going to go out and watch the game together somewhere, and so it's like the eyes are still going to be on those ads. And I think there's, you know, now the ratings may be down because people are out watching it all collectively and, you know, you're missing that sort of thing. But I just, I, I think people are still going to watch it. And, uh, but again, it won't necessarily reflect in the ratings because you'll have 500 people watching it at one place instead of 500 people watching it at home. And, and that will skew some things, but I like the idea, but of course, you know, I'm a shut in. So <laughs> you're at the game anyway. What difference does it make to you? Why do you don't get a vote? I would love to have Saturday off. Um, so, so that's, that's that I'm with you. I don't, you don't need two weeks off. Like let's, I, I understand you have to move around the NFL, but we don't need to go 14 days or, you know, just, I, I would say like the first available window, get it done, you know, eat for each of those and, and make it work. And you've got time. Uh, obviously, more than seven days. Uh, clearly, I'm not saying anything like that. But um, so the Rose Bowl and Orange Bowl, like at this point, if you can make it work, make it work. I am, you know, people talk about the, the what about the bowl games and what about this and that. And then I think most of the people who say that work for bowls, um, you know, uh, you, you had the 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 director of the bowls i don't even know his name was you know once all of the first he thinks the first round game should be at the poll sites and of course you do <laughs> of course you do and why would you want to have college football games on a campus that's gross uh you're trying you know they, they're trying to keep these bowls alive any way they can and i don't know that it's you know it, it, have the playoffs killed bowl games like i don't yes next question I mean, they were they're were already dying when the BCS came around. You know, like when the BCS started, and and they got sickly from that. But yeah, it's like there's this is a way to I think, um, you know, keep them alive and, and keep them going. But all of these superf- superfluous bowls, you know, we didn't have those before the BCS. You know, we didn't have, we didn't have forty bowl games, and the more bowl games you have, then it's like. The, the 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 less you have to pay attention to almost. Well, and I think that, you know, the BCS and the college football playoff are the ones that are kind of the easy people to blame for the demise or the irrelevance of some bowl games. And, you know, I I say all of this. Tony and I have attended a uh, Cheez-It Bowl in person 
uh, but you know, semi recently, 2019, when we were down in in uh, uh, Phoenix for the Fiesta Bowl, it was like, yeah, we'll go, let's go watch the Cheez It Bowl because it's like, hey, college football in person, this isn't so bad. So you know, I I say this as someone who will not only uh, watch these games on TV, but if they're available. Try and seek them out in person. I tried to get Tony to stop at the Liberty Bowl when you're driving home from the Cotton Bowl in 2017. So I am uh, I am on the far right end of the spectrum in terms of uh, will will watch slash attend these ball games. But you know the BCS and the college football playoff have certainly killed some of the relevance of some of those ball games. The other thing that's really killed the relevance is ESPN. And you know ESPN every time they talk about this, it's the uh, you know. Uh, the, the gif of the guy in the hot dog costume, uh, you know, we're trying to find the guy who did this, and it's like, yeah, guess what? It was ESPN, because guess who owns a whole bunch of these bowl games? All these, all the bowl games that you're like, I'm sorry, the what now? The Gasparilla Bowl? What? The ESPN started and owns all of those, and it's just, so there is TV inventory for them during the week between Christmas and New Year's. That's it. They are not. They are not playing the Gasparilla Bowl for the love of the game. They are playing the Gasparilla Bowl because they need something to show on ESPN two at two in the afternoon on December twenty sixth or whatever day it is. So, the fact that there's so many means all the individual ones matter so much less than they used to. So, that's one of the reasons bowls are, are not quite as relevant as they used to be. But also, it's just the whole ESPN has kind of killed the whole you know a lot of college football as the sport itself because the whole. Well, the whole narrative all season is just around the college football playoff. So it's like the whole season is just about these three games at the end of the season, two of which are usually complete piles of garbage because the gap of the gap between, you know, teams one and two and three and four in the season. The semifinals are generally kind of crap. And it's like that's two thirds of the game that ESPN spends the whole season telling you you need to care about. So I, I think I think we should not let ESPN off the hook when we're talking about why bowls have, uh, you know, kind of lost their relevance, all the other bowls. But. You know, at this point, well, I mean, they they kind of have the. It used to be the New Year New Year's Day was just there were like the six bowl games that were on or whatever it was, and that was it. And now it's just and and there were only. But I mean, when we were kids, what there were, fifteen bowl games, maybe something like that. And now there's like forty. So it's just there. There's just only so much that people can care about. Um, at least unless they're you know, cheese at bowl attending crazy people. So. You know, I, I just at this point, I think it's I they find it very important. There, Some of the people in charge find it very important to keep some of the big bowl games uh, as part of the, you know, as part of this process. And like, I get it. It's fine. If you want to make the semifinals or the quarterfinals, like whatever, that's fine. But yeah, campus campus sites would be far superior to bowl games in terms of atmosphere, in terms of all of that, in terms of, you know, fan experience, because, hey, then I don't need to fly to Phoenix to watch my team play in the quarterfinals. Because if you're an Alabama fan, are you going to go to the, the quarterfinal game? Probably not, because you're hoping to go to the semifinal game. And then are you going to go to the semifinal game if they're favored? Like, well, maybe I'm going to save up my money for the national championship game. And so you wonder, you wonder how many people are really going to be traveling potentially three weeks in a row to these different sites. Yeah, and I'm with you on the ESPN thing. If you put anything on it, 2 p.m. on a Thursday in December, like you, you, all they're looking for is better ratings than they get when they have their normal 2 p.m. Whatever is that, you know, Sports Center? I don't even know some debate show. You know, you just don't want to dip, and and it's like it's it's background. Like they, they they only care so much about it. Like as you said, they just need inventory. They need something to put on to air some commercials. And that's how they treat it, and then that's how it gets viewed. And, and and I say viewed not by eyeballs, but in terms of perception and how people think about it. So, um, But there will always be a place for it as long as ESPN needs to show games, and they will. So the, the next thing I want to talk about, Tom, is the coaches meeting with juniors off campus. This is um, – I, I wonder who wants this more. Is it is it the coaches at Memphis or is it the coaches at Alabama where – um, you the the smaller schools want to be able to get in person in front of these people as, as quickly as they can because they're the first to offer. But Alabama and Ohio State can just come in whenever, like after that, and steal this way. Is this do the do the smaller schools want this or do the bigger schools want this? Because I'm I, I know Urban hated Urban Meyer hated the way things were moving up, the calendar moving up. 
I just who who does this benefit more? I think it benefits the smaller schools more, I think, because then you can kind of prioritize the guys and, and make them, you know, make them understand that you in the same way that, you know, being an early offer, you start building that in person relationship. I think it's gonna benefit the smaller schools more. And, you know, the as far as Alabama goes, you know, Nick Saban, the the, the current rule is is uh, you know, they basically a bump rule where it's like, oh, I happen to bump into this person and I can just say hi. And uh, you ask folks around college football, and Nick Saban has gotten very good at utilizing the bump rule. It's like he just coincidentally bumps into folks, and he's you know he's not the only one. He's just one of those people that you know there's there are rules, and then there's ways to you know work within those rules to achieve the ultimate goals that you want to achieve. So you know I don't know how much this really changes, other than people are going to be now be bumping into much younger players. You know, oops, hey, hi, sorry, look at you, I'm sorry, sorry, I knocked your books out of your hand. How about that? Um, I, I do think maybe this is going to benefit some of the smaller schools to a certain degree because of what you said, where, you know, a guy who's a little under the radar, if, you know, if a Memphis or a, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, Michigan state or whoever is going to start building those relationships and, and really, you know, having, having more in-person contact, that seems like that would be beneficial to them. It's just way to, you know, because if Alabama is not able to pay attention to you yet, then, you know, that, that kind of helps them build the relationship. The real interesting question, though, is, so if and when they do expand the coaching staffs beyond the 10 assistant coaches and you can have, you know, potentially, you know, I, is it 12 coaches? Is it 15 coaches? Is it an unlimited number of assistant coaches? Does Alabama just have 60 assistant coaches and then they're out visiting with every single player every single day, every, you know, and, and that, you know, that, that would be probably, you know, great for assistant coaches in terms of more guys being able to earn a, uh, earn a real lucrative living in terms of this. But I don't know, uh, that would certainly be, make this not at all beneficial for the smaller schools. So right now, I think there's a way it might be beneficial for the smaller schools, but with future rule changes potentially coming down the pike in future years, that might completely negate all of this. I think to really help the smaller schools, you would need to allow players to sign as juniors, you know, allow them to sign earlier. But then it's like almost entrapment in a sense, you know, with, with a lot of th these things. But, you know, the recruiting coaches, when the when they expanded to the 10th assistant, there were a lot of people who thought that was just going to be a recruiting position where that coach would just be in schools, basically, and, and building relationships. But, uh, you know, it, that's not how it has turned out. I don't think anybody has used it that way. They've used it for on-field stuff and extra defensive backs coach or an extra offensive line coach or defensive line coach or a special teams coordinator in Ohio State's case. Uh, one of the last things I want to touch on here is the 48-hour dead period prior to the portal, the December 5th portal open. Because I think coaches need to just be able to forget about recruiting and focus on their team, like who is coming, who is leaving, who is staying, whatever. Like you have nothing else to worry about other than these guys and figuring out where things are. And I imagine coaches were like, can we just please not have recruiting for like three days here? And that way we can just figure out our own team and know what's going on and just not have anything else to worry about because recruiting is a 365 day a year thing. And now you have to continue to recruit your own existing players as well. And so if you can have some time where it's just one or the other and they can just focus on their team, I think this is something that probably needs to be expanded from the proposed two days to an entire week where you can sit down with all of your players and not just worry about the have no, no concerns or, you know, having to touch on this recruit or this recruit. It's like, I can't, because if you do it now and you ignore those guys, you're ignoring them at the worst possible time because signing day is coming up. So now if there's a rule that you have to ignore them, now coaches can do it uh, stress-free almost. Well, this just seems like this is a very necessary HR period. And I, I like your suggestion about making that a week because, you know, this goes hand in hand with a rule that has been in effect, already went into effect. But I don't know that everyone is completely aware of it. This kind of might have gone under the radar. And frankly, I don't know if we've talked about it that much on this show before, where now there's a, you know, you get the one-time transfer exception, but there's a 45-day transfer window that begins December 5th, and there's another 15-day window that starts May 1st. So essentially, to get that one-time transfer exception, you can transfer, essentially, 
you know, in the month and a half after the start, end of the regular season, so end of the regular season after the bowl game, you can transfer in that window for 45 days. And then essentially after spring ball, you can transfer for a couple of weeks after everyone's spring ball ends, which those are the logical times for people to transfer, I think, where you kind of have, you know, you can have the end of season conversation and figure out where do you stand going into next spring? What do you need to work on? Where are you? Are Is there a meaningful path to the, to the playing field for you? Or are you just kind of stuck and they're bringing in other folks? The advantage of having those conversations during that, you know, the right now 45, 48 hour dead period uh, before that December 5th portal opening, but, you know, hopefully make it a week is you can have those conversations and then players know where they stand and they can make an informed decision about whether they're going to enter the portal and where they might land and all that kind of stuff. And also coaches can make informed decisions in terms of, okay, these six players are going to be leaving. So that means instead of 22 scholarships, we can give out 24 scholarships now uh, in the early signing period, which has now been bumped back a couple days to give them a little more time to accommodate, you know, accommodate that. So th this all makes a lot of sense to me. And I I'm with you. I think you, you give people, give people a week, let people have a full week to do evaluation, have those conversations you know, have follow-up conversations. If you need to talk to parents, you need to, you know, you want to talk to your position coach and your coordinator and your head coach all at the same time, whatever, like take the time, do that right, help set people up for success because it is a one-time transfer exception. So you don't want to be, you know, ping-ponging around and, and leaving and then immediately, you know, you get to your new place and, oh, well, I want to leave there now. You, you are eventually going to have to, you know, sit out. You're not going to get that transfer exception every time. So if you're going to be limiting the amount of time that guys can transfer, for the benefit of college coaches, which is what this is, the 45-day transfer window and then the 15-day transfer window, if you're going to be limiting student-athletes in terms of when they can transfer, you should give them every opportunity to have as much information and be as informed uh, as they possibly can before those those kind of narrow windows so they can make the best decisions for themselves. Yeah, try having like 60 exit interviews in two days. Like That's, that's very difficult to do. Uh, the last one seems like it should already be a rule, uh, and I thought it was. Prohibiting coaches from visiting players in the transfer portal on their current campus. Is that, is that the Tim Beckman rule where he was in Illinois and recruiting Penn State players? Although he wasn't on campus. He's like across the street from campus, if I recall. He was, I believe, at a hotel across campus. Yes. You beat me. You beat me to the Tim Beckman joke. Tim Beckman rule joke. Yes. That was maybe the most egregious, uh, example of, of this ever. But you know, I suspect that there has been, um, I don't want to throw around a word like tampering, but uh, I suspect that there has been uh, perhaps some additional contact beyond what is strictly legal uh, during some of these times. And, you know, you can't you can't visit players on their current campus. You can't visit if you're visiting uh, one player, you're visiting the wide receiver. Uh, the quarterback can't also be there if the quarterback isn't also in the transfer portal. You can't have, you know, you can't do group interviews where uh, only one of the guys is in the transfer portal. So. This this seems like one of these rules that uh, is probably let's let's call it a common sense rule that will probably uh, have a lot of workarounds. I'm sure relatively quickly. You know how like college basketball coaches will buy pizzas for the fans, the students, you know, out in line. I assume like Tim Beckman did that. It's like, hey, buying pizzas for anybody, <laughs> you know, any whoever wants to stop by. If you're interested in transferring, doesn't matter, you know. I just just got some pizzas over here. Come on over. And it, well, I'm not even on campus. This is totally, this is just, I was just, you know, I'm just buying some college kids some food. That's all. There's nothing, nothing wrong with that, right? Is this America? Is this still America? I thought this was America. It's like, no, sir. This is backwoods, Pennsylvania. <laughs> uh, anything else, Tom, before we go? No, I think we're, uh, I think we've kind of covered the new rule changes. It, it's, this is a little, con this is a little concerning because this feels, a lot of this feels kind of common sensey, so it's like I feel like I agree with the majority of this stuff, so it's probably not all going to happen. I'm sure that the, you know, I'm sure that somehow this is going to end up with the Rose Bowl getting played on December 27th, and uh, this, you know, that somehow the national championship game not happening till March, but that's how this t kind of typically goes for things, but it's it's like right now we're early enough in the process that all the uh, good and logical options are still on the table, so uh, we're going we're gonna to take that as a win. Do you really want to trigger the Rose Bowl? You tell them they have to move to like December 28th, but the Orange Bowl gets to stay January 1st. <laughs> They're going to pick up their building and go home. Is this because you didn't get your vest? Is that why you're salty at the Rose Bowl? Tom, let's not talk about the vest. 
And I want to talk about the bowl swag that I did not get that everybody else got. And I tweeted about and texted about how great it was. And I'm sure it was. And Tom even wore his vest on the show when it was like 84 degrees out. <laughs> yes, heat heat stroke is, is a dangerous thing. But spite, spite is more powerful than that. So. Yes, it's and it's always worth it. So, all right, then that will do it for this episode. Tomorrow on the Buckeye Weekly Podcast, it is Tom's favorite, Bold Predictions. And I'm looking forward to being done with that show so that uh, we can be through with that and uh, get back to our jovial nature. I'm already getting angry, angry Tom. So, um, good job. Good job. This is going to be fantastic. All right. Thank you for joining us, everyone. A reminder to check us out at BuckeyeHuddle.com. Please become a member if you are even thinking about it. If you thought, you know what, I should try it. Give it a try. See what you think. If you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe. If you have already, thank you. If you haven't hit the bell, go ahead and do that. You'll be notified when we drop all kinds of stuff. And we've got a bunch of stuff planned for this weekend because it's a pretty big game against Wisconsin. So that will do it for this episode. Thank you all for tuning in, and we will talk to you later.